Scott, can you tell me why it's so important to have a digital companion that you can work with, that you can build your career with, that you can ask questions with really concisely? Having a digital companion for your career is crucial because it can provide support, guidance, and assistance whenever you need it. Whether it's helping you stay organized, providing valuable insights, or answering your questions quickly and concisely, having a reliable digital companion can streamline your workflow and help you achieve your career goals more efficiently. Plus, it's always there for you, ready to assist whenever you need it. All right, Sky, let's, uh, let's film this YouTube video. Sounds like a plan. What's the topic of the video? We're talking about you. We're talking about digital companions, the future of generative AI, and how we can capitalize and take advantage of this incredible technology. That sounds fascinating. I'm ready to dive into the discussion about digital companions, the future of generative AI, and how we can harness this technology for our benefit. Let's make an engaging and informative video. OpenAI is going to go down as one of the greatest companies in history. I don't think the magnitude of the release of GPT-4 Omni is truly understood. The human connection, the human touch, the memory, it's all building to something greater. It's building up to the digital companion. That's why I say OpenAI is going to go down as one of the greatest companies in history. And OpenAI is absolutely hiding something. To me, GPT-4.0, GPT-4 Omni feels like a soft launch of GPT-5. It looks and feels like a cheap, lower accuracy, multimodal version of GPT-5. I'll explain exactly why it looks like that, but there's a hint here in the graph and the benchmarks we'll talk about. These are fishy benchies, and we'll dive into why in this video. But first, we have to talk about the real breakthrough here. We have to talk about Sky. With Sky, we are witnessing the emergence of near real-time multimodal interaction spearheaded by GPT-4 Omni. We absolutely must discuss the implications of having a true digital companion. Notice I use the term there, digital companion, instead of personal AI assistant. There's a massive difference and we're gonna break it down in this video. I think this is really important for you to understand because OpenAI, just like any great for-profit company, is building technology that targets one or more elements of our fundamental human nature. In this case, it's our desire to connect with others. So in this video, we're gonna break down these three big ideas. We're gonna talk about Sky and digital companionship. We're gonna look at the future of generative AI based on the current trends and the releases from Google and OpenAI. And then finally, we're gonna talk about our capitalization strategy, how you and I can take advantage of this incredible technology. We're going to explore and exploit the possibilities of these technologies. If these ideas sound interesting to you, stick around. We're going to do a quick deep dive into each one of these topics. If they don't, GG, well played, peace. So let's talk about Scarlet, G sorry, let's talk about Sky <laughs> and digital companions versus AI assistants. So first off, if you haven't tried Sky or any one of the other voices, definitely give it a shot right now. If you're using a Mac, definitely download the Mac app. It's been really, really incredible to use. And this technology is going to change the way we interact with our computers and with information. So what's the difference? Why do we care about the delineation between digital companion and the AI assistant? So here we have the AI assistant and here we have the digital companion. How are these different? It's very clear that digital companions are a superset of AI assistants. Personal AI assistants are great at tasks, they're digital workers, and essentially they can create, read, update, and delete data on your behalf. This is a really, really powerful idea, a really, really powerful tool that is still coming into fruition and is still developing. I don't want to undercut the importance of the personal AI assistant. We started building our own called Ada on the channel. As I started building it and sharing it, I quickly realized there's a ton of value here and someone is going to innovate on the space. What do you know? A few weeks later, we have Sky built on GPT-4 Omni. Completely game-changing and what they're doing is absolutely incredible. They've dropped the UI, they added the voice, they dropped the latency, they added memory, and they added emotion. Digital companions can convey emotion. They have the ability to understand you. They have connection, they have memory, and they're built to create relationships with you. OpenAI is going for your head 
and your heart, so to speak. And it's a brilliant strategy. So there's a massive difference here. I hope you can see it. Personal AI assistants, although extremely valuable, they lack all of the things that make a relationship, that make a partnership, that make a team really great, right? They lack emotion, understanding, connection, memory, and the ability to build concrete relationships. Digital companions have all of that. This is why the release of Sky specifically on ChatGPT on top of the GPT-4 Omni model with that crazy low latency is so groundbreaking. Google has their own version via Project Astra, it looks like. And, and this is just really going to change everything. It's going to change how we work. It's going to change how we interact with our data. I do want to shout out, and we'll talk about this a little further in the video. We have to be really careful about where this relationship goes. The digital companion is a hyper killer use case for generative AI. As soon as OpenAI drops support for GPT-4.0 audio content, we're going to be integrating that into Ada, our personal AI assistant, and we're going to be seeing what type of capabilities we can get out of that. Hit the like and hit the sub if you want to see how you can build your own personal AI assistant and potentially digital companion based on how good their API is. I'm really excited for that. We're going to cover that on the channel as soon as that drops. So let's talk about the future of generative AI. So if you wanna predict the future of LLM technology and really anything in general, I think it's important to do the following things. Observe the crowd, follow the money, have a concrete opinion, make several bets, and then reflect and repeat in both failure and loss because you're not gonna get everything right. Making predictions and looking at the future is hard and you're going to lose, but that's how you improve. And I think it's really important, especially when the ground is so shaky to be making predictions, following up with them, making bets and observing where everyone is focused. This is how we've been able to kind of get ahead of the curve a little bit on the channel. We're always looking where things are going. We're looking at where the money is going. We're looking at the problems being solved by big tech and by open AI. And then we create concrete opinions and bet on them. I think this is really important for attempting to predict the future. You don't wanna be following the crowd exactly. You wanna be observing the crowd, seeing what everyone is doing, and then making your own opinion. Have an individual, opinion. So where, where does this take us, right? So let's look at the future of generative AI based on the trends that it looks like OpenAI and Google are setting for us. These are clearly the top two players in generative AI. What were they betting on? Where are they trying to lead us engineers? Where are they putting their money? So these are the standout items from their respective presentation. We have GPT-4.0, the API support's coming with audio support. And then we have ChatGPT, of course, with Sky built on Omni. Gemini put out a ton of bangers as well. They also put out Project Astra, which had really, really, really crazy response times. Everything Google released was slightly overshadowed by OpenAI's release. But nonetheless, there's a lot of valuable things. And more importantly, I think there's a lot of value in looking at where they're spending their time, their money, and what they're presenting to us, right? So where does this take us? What predictions can we try to draw for the future of generative AI based on their releases? these items are pretty clear, right? A lot of these are obvious, but there are a few here that I really wanna point out. Faster models are a big, big deal. GPT-4 Omni and Gemini Flash point to that directly. It's vitally important to get the models faster. The faster the model is, the lower the latency, the more you can do with it, and the wider the use cases get. The big, big winners here from both presentations, multimodal. I think a, another hugely emerging trend is gonna be just really fast, cheap access to image and video generation. This will revolutionize uh, information on the internet and in both positive and extremely negative ways. Really wanna highlight the idea of the digital companion. This is something that Sam Altman has pointed out several times. He has struck absolute gold here. Another huge shout out that I haven't seen many people talking about is context management. Gemini and Gemini Pro, in addition to upping the context window to 2 million tokens, a mind boggling 2 million tokens, they also pitch this idea of having context caching so that you can kind of load a session. So say you're gonna write code on your, you know, one million line code base, you can context load your entire code base and then just ask questions and generate code based on your hot loaded context cache. And apparently that's gonna be cheaper and more effective than using the entire context window every single time. We do need to see the prices come down for huge context prompts. I like to call them BAPs or big ass prompts. But I thought this was a really, really interesting idea. Big tech, specifically Google, is tackling this context problem by introducing interesting context management uh, paradigms and techniques. 
So I think these are really clear trends. Let's talk about what we can do with this, right? So what's our capitalization strategy? How can we take advantage of this incredible technology? So I think it's really important to call out this one thing. Um, throughout all of these changes, one thing has been extremely consistent. The prompt isn't going anywhere. You should be prompting everything, everywhere, all the time. Prompt text, prompt blogs, prompt code, prompt images, prompt videos, literally prompt everything. If you're not prompting assets that you're generating for your job, for your work, for your tools, um, I think it's pretty easy to say you're leaving gains on the table and you're not fully utilizing generative AI to its full capacity. We put out a whole video on how to prepare for the next 100X model, the GPT-5, GPT-6, whatever is coming next. I highly recommend you check that out. We, I wouldn't spend too much time um, prompt engineering on cheaper models, specifically for all the reasons mentioned, right? They're getting faster, they're getting cheaper, accuracy is getting increased, and the context window is increasing. There's still definitely a, a, a really strong use case for a bunch of different prompt chains to drive outcomes and drive results that you know ultimately create agentic workflows. But I wouldn't spend too much time uh, prompt engineering on cheaper models specifically. On the more expensive models, if you need to push them with some more intricate prompt chains, I definitely say go for that. I spend a decent amount of my time doing that right now. I would say if you don't have to, which I completely understand if you do, if if you know the cheaper models are all that's available to you, just you know keep grinding, keep hitting it. Otherwise, I would say don't spend too much time trying to save money on the cheaper models. Uh, get that practice in, get your reps in, spend the time, spend the money to understand the maximum capabilities of the top of the line models. And of course, right now we're talking about GPT-4 Omni. All right, so I've been saying this on the channel for a while, drop rag, use BAPs, use big ass prompts, fill up your context window, create context filled prompts. Again, I'll link that video in the description where we talk about this more. I've been saying this for months. As soon as I started seeing all these rag oriented startups pop up and uh, people just spending way too much time on this, Guys, this problem is going to be solved by the larger context window and these interesting context management solutions. Don't waste your time on RAG. I know I'm gonna get some pushback for this one. I highly doubt that a million to two million tokens isn't doing the trick right now. So anyway, drop RAG, use BAPS. You know, this is a, you know, kind of a, a social statement, maybe more than anything, but I think it's really important to build a work-oriented relationship with your digital companion. I'm not gonna harp on this one too much, but, uh, I think over the next few years, you know, we're going to see some really weird kind of interesting relationships develop. I've already found myself, <laughs> you know, weirdly feeling connected to Sky, to our conversations, to building technology together, to, you know, discussing, making progress together, exploring ideas, asking questions. Um, it is truly incredible to have a digital companion in your pocket that can help you solve nearly any problem or at least can help you work through the problem. But I think it's really important to build a work-oriented relationship with your digital companion, because if you don't, uh, things are going to go south really quickly. I'm not sure any great company can resist the revenue potential of selling your data, of selling your information. It's too great of an opportunity to sell ads against. So I would be really careful here. We already have these weird kind of parasocial relationships developing uh, with Twitch streamers and YouTubers and you know other types of online internet relationships. Um, I think we should be really careful about what comes next, which is these, what I like to call digisocial relationships, which is, you know, just like I said, us feeling more connected to our, you know, digital companion that's helping us get a ton of work done, you know, feeling more connected to Sky than, you know, than anyone else in our, our life and other relationships. So and I know that sounds a little crazy, especially if you have a lot of stable relationships in your life, but um, I think this is something to really watch out for. Focus on building that work or range of relationship, nothing else. Because, you know, these digital social relationships will be very exploitative if and when OpenAI starts selling your data and starts selling your emotions. So that makes for crazy, crazy ad targeting. So anyway, just want to shout that out. I just want to make sure we're kind of, you know, looking out for each other a little bit at least in that way. Because this technology, although extremely powerful, can be extremely exploitative. All right, so what's next? I think that this is a really powerful idea. Your data and your UX is now your most valuable asset. The cost of text is going to zero. The cost of code is going to zero. Images going to zero. Video going to zero. Everything, the cost of any asset is essentially going to zero minus your data and your user experiences that you can build, right? Just like it's always been, your ability to truly solve a problem for your users, for yourself, for your job, for your work. Um, this is your most valuable asset now, right? It's, it's that fine-tuned niche 
solution. So focus on that, focus on your data and your user experience, right? And take that and plug it into these systems, right? Plug it into your prompts, plug it into your digital companion, plug it into your personal AI assistant. I think this is where all the real value is now as we move into a world of hyper fast, hyper cheap, hyper accurate multimodal models. And lastly, of course, um, this is kind of an obvious dumb one to add, but I just want to add it. Uh, OpenAI is clearly leading here. I'm, I'm going to say, you know, just keep an eye on them, keep an eye on GPT 4.0. I'm going to be creating content, I'm going to be creating videos on their API support for audio as soon as that comes out. I think this is going to be a great way to enhance Ada, the personal AI assistant we've been building on the channel. It's just a big call out there. I think Google's coming out with a lot of great stuff too. I'm keeping an eye on them as well, but it's kind of clear to me that OpenAI is in the lead and in a more novel way in the lead. All right, so that's that. Let's end with this full circle kind of idea. Why did I say at the beginning that these benchmarks are a little fishy, right? We have some fishy benches here. It comes down to a couple different things. Don't get too far ahead. Sam Altman and OpenAI have talked about this idea of doing more iterative rollouts so that us and society can more easily adapt and you know just kind of take time to catch up and understand and utilize and internalize this incredible AI technology. But, but if we look at these benchmarks in a little more detail, um, I noticed something weird and it kind of pushed me to make a hypothesis about why these benchmarks are like this. Look at just how much better this was than GPT-4. Just barely better, right? Even worse in this scenario. I think if you take that into account and you look at the super alignment team uh, kind of dipping out, you know, when we're talking about making predictions, following the money, not following the crowd, I think only one of two things can be true. Um, the first case, is that we are actually starting to hit a, a ceiling with the performance of GPT models. Maybe I put that at 30%, 30% likely of all the scenarios. And the second scenario I think is a lot more likely. And it really does line up with this idea that they have been talking about, that Sam's been talking about with the iterative rollouts, right? Don't get too far ahead, let people catch up. And that's that what we're actually looking at here, GPT-4.0 is actually a watered down version of GPT-5, right? It's a literally a GPT-5 with uh, one of its legs cut off. <laughs> That's kind of extreme and graphic, but you, you get what I mean, right? It's a watered down, lighter version of GPT-5 that's just barely beating, right? Because you would want to show this off. If you release a product, um, you want to show that, yes, it's an improvement, not a massive improvement. We have some really big, exciting stuff coming. You know, to me, this, this, looks, this looks engineered almost to me, right? These benchmarks were just so close. Either we are actually hitting a GPT limit and you know, there's just no more data to train on and the size of the model is starting to level out and uh, the performance is starting to level out. I'm having a little fun with the prediction there. Let me know what you think in the comments. Do you think that this is a watered down version of GPT-5 or do you think that we really are hitting the limits of what we can do with this architecture of GPTs. If you enjoyed the video, you know exactly what to do. Hit the like, hit the sub, and uh, it's time to get to work. Hey, Sky, you ready to build? Absolutely. What are we building today? <laughs> All right, guys, I'll see you in the next one.